Welcome to our Culture Builders podcast. My name is Matt Wright. I'm here with uh, Christian Nielsen. And today we're going to highlight Travis Kalanick, former CEO of Uber. Some of you may be wondering, well, how is uh, Travis like the other leaders that you've highlighted? This podcast, those who follow it know that we try to highlight leaders who succeed through people and through building best in class cultures. But Travis isn't known for that. So Christian, why did we choose Travis as somebody to highlight? I think we selected because it, it was an interesting case study in, or more of a cautionary tale. What can go wrong or what's another extreme kind of carried out in a negative sense? Yeah. I mean, certainly Uber is a wildly successful company. It has its challenges. It has, you know, share of scandals, but it's a force and it changed the economy in many respects. I mean, Travis in some regards, is considered the father of the gig economy. So we're not here to sort of, you know, lay at his feet all problems associated with culture, but there are some interesting insights that we gleaned as we dug deeper into Travis. Let me give our listeners just a quick bio. He's from Northridge, California. He comes from Slovakian, Austrian heritage, hence the Kalanick name. He was a UCLA student and then dropped out to work on a project he called Scour. Scour was a bit of a peer-to-peer file sharing platform. And those platforms, if you remember, had challenges in the late 90s, early 2000s. Eventually Scour and Scour 2.0, which he called Red Swoosh, were shut down. But he was able to sell them and for some decent money. And that gave him the ability to think about what was next as he considered his entrepreneurial activities. Then we get to Uber in 2009. He is sitting around with his friend, Garrett Camp, they're in Paris, and they're lamenting how bad transportation options are, and the idea of Uber was born. So he starts building Uber. They go out and get money from private equity firms uh, like Google Ventures, and they are Silicon Valley rock stars. But there was something lurking in the back of Uber, and I call it the bro culture, so Christian, you and I have joked about the bro culture before, but do you want to kind of talk a little bit about what we mean when we say bro culture? Kind of this culture that prizes an aggressive nature, uh, macho, obnoxious, toxic behavior is, is one way that we might describe it. You see it with certain organizations. And interestingly, sometimes you, you see it in extremes where organizations are, are successful or having some initial success. A lot of sales cultures thrive on kind of what we informally call bro culture, but it gets to a point where I think it eats itself and it can't really hide from the light of day, at least as we're seeing maybe a surrounding culture that's less tolerant of that type of extreme bravado and kind of exclusionary vibe that that some of these organizations build. You make a great point that the bro culture is um, accepted because sometimes you need that dynamic to just break down barriers. And uh, the question now, I think a lot of investors and capitalists are asking themselves is, do we need that? Is that, you know, after coming out of 2020 with Black Lives Matter movements and a greater emphasis on how people fit within cultures, you know, I think investors are are asking themselves, do, do we have to put up with the bro culture to get its benefits or is there a better way? And I'm not sure. Yeah, it's it's interesting because you know on one hand I'm really I'm really impressed by anyone that challenges convention and disrupts and certainly taxi and transportation was ripe for that and someone saw that and these two founders were really on the the front lines of that, but in terms of you know challenging convention versus flaunting it and think we're above the rules or social norms or just morality, I think that's where it becomes a, a real problem. So. It, we're wondering if Travis has learned his lesson. He has just been reported recently in The Verge in his new startup, Cloud Kitchens. This is the exact quote. Inside Cloud Kitchens, people describe an alpha male organization helmed by a temple of bros in which Kalanick and two pals reign supreme and where a fight club-like code of secrecy affects all aspects of the job. Visual cues like no quinoa t-shirts worn by Kalanick loyalists reinforce a hard knock culture that frowns on coddled techies. I can't think of a much better description of the bro culture than that. And it's interesting that that's still coming out even today. That's just sort of how he's wired. 
The question is, is will he be able to keep it under control, which he really wasn't able to do at, at Uber. In prepping for the podcast, some of the headlines we would see is 49 of the biggest scandals in Uber's history. You know, that one caught my eye is the fact that, wow, they, we've documented 49 scandals. He, he was criticized for sexism, for having promotions that would, you know, cross the line when it came to women, or he would refer to his company in sexist terms. He was caught on camera fighting, kind of childish-like in a way with a, a driver of Uber. It just it sort of felt like he couldn't get past his DNA in many respects. Wanted to share with you just snippets of an actual email that Travis had written to Uber employees prior to kind of a corporate retreat in Florida. And I don't want to share all the details, but let's just say that it's an HR leader's nightmare because he goes and he talks about no lives should begin or end at the event. We don't want to bail anyone out of jail. He says, don't throw large kegs off of tall buildings. And my point is when you're listing out these specific do's and don'ts, it means you've experienced them before. (laughs) And when you're the CEO putting these things in a a memo to all employees, I mean, you're building the culture right there. And you're saying we're hard partying. We don't care about the rules. This is, you know, this lifestyle we're trying to foster here. And, you know, you can't blame everything around the Uber culture on this one individual, but you know, you build an organization in your own image and likeness, and it's hard to separate this man's whole vibe and, and the culture that he built around him. Point six is my favorite. There will be a $200 puke charge for any public displays on the short club premises. So there you go. And of course, then all of this is supposed to be kept under a wrap of secrecy. You know, don't talk to the press. So when you say don't talk to the press, that means you know something's up. Eventually, Uber meets a formidable foe, a very bright and very, very capable software engineer named Susan Fowler. And there's a quote that she says, every time something ridiculous happened, every time a sexist email was sent, I sent a short report to HR just to keep a record going. And so for the short while that she was employed by Uber making the app that became the backbone of what we experience today, this ride-sharing platform. Susan Fowler was dealing with all sorts of problems. They were kind of icky. And I just thought I would uh, share a few quotes directly from her blog, which is out there for any of you to find. So when I joined Uber, she says, the organization I was part of was over 25% women. And by the time I was trying to transfer to another organization, this number had dropped down to less than 6%. Women were transferring out of the organization, and those who couldn't transfer were quitting or preparing to quit. There were two major reasons for this. There was the organizational chaos, and there was also the sexism within the organization. Kind of the bro culture, chaos and organizational sexism. When I asked our director at an org, All Hands, about what was being done about the dwindling numbers of women in the org compared to the rest of the company, his reply was in a nutshell, that women of Uber just needed to step up and be better engineers. So kind of crazy. And, uh, and she just notes that on her last day, she calculated the percentage of women who were still at the organization, and there were only 3% were women. So she goes from 25% to 3%. Pretty frustrating. Pretty frustrating for those women and certainly for Uber's investors. So, Christian, now we're going to come to the challenges what does HR do when it is part, when it's either got a leader that's wired this way or it's in the midst of these challenges? What should HR do? What is HR's role when dealing with a bro culture? Yeah, there's this concept that I, I've been thinking about and kind of forming in my own mind around cultural mass. It's easier to make changes when the company's smaller. And uh, in its infancy. So if HR is, you know, those HR leaders that were there in the beginning, you know, spotting some of that, understanding their responsibility and what the direction we're going with culture, that's a much easier decision point than later on. You know, one article I found from uh, related to this that was called Uber, the true cost of toxic leadership was really interesting because ultimately they had to hire more HR because they were in so much problem. So if you're part of the HR, they're 
they're just throwing on the pile to kind of cover up or to to solve or to, to deal with issues that have already arisen. It's a much more difficult battle. But your responsibility is to the organization, not to cover up or hide or excuse bad behavior by leadership, even if it's that leadership that hired you. And it can put you in a very tough spot as an HR leader, as an HR business partner, if you're thrown into that culture. And so it, it, it is, those can be challenging waters to navigate. We're lucky enough to represent a few private equity firms here, and we're seeing private equity care about their portfolio companies. And I think one of the things that's going to need to happen is is the investors in private equity, when they recognize that they've got leaders wired this way, as you said, bring on a strong HR leader right from the beginning. So often HR is viewed as that, I don't want to deal, push it off, push it off. They'll get in our way. This is like a tax. I don't want to do it. But I think smart investors are going to say, we're going to protect our investment the same way we protect it legally with all sorts of legal documentation from a corporate finance perspective. I think they're going to start protecting it from these types of scenarios. Right. They're, I mean, you think of the, the cost. If you're thinking just purely from an investment standpoint, I mean, this organization lost business. There was a delete Uber movement where people were trying to, you know, actually campaigning, take it off your phone because of the, the type of, of people are, that are working there and the culture they've built. There were increased legal fees to cover up harassment suits. There were had to replace executives and all the co- costs associated. It's bad business. So even though if you look at net worth, the market rewarded it to a certain extent, a large extent. But how much more would those rewards have been? And also his, his legacy. And additionally, he wouldn't have been kicked out in sp- of the company he helped create. And so it, it is a very interesting case study to look at and see what this type of leadership can do to a culture and do to uh, market value and do to um, just employee experience. Lyft is a formidable c- competitor, but I think certainly if Uber was not dealing with the fallout from negative publicity, I bet you it's worth more. And I bet you those are hundreds of millions of dollars on, on paper valuations for this organization. And who knows if they would have experienced the pushback they've experienced related to worker classification as independent contractors right. or the other things that they're facing. Those have been exacerbated by some of this sort of culture and this like, we don't really care. You know, they, they had an incident where a, a passenger was sexually assaulted and you find out that the executives are trying to cover it up, you know, and, and that doesn't, that's not going to help your cause. What would you say to an entrepreneur who is starting a business and wants to sort of be hard charging, wants to the play hard, work hard mentality? What advice would you, if that friend from, you know, business school comes to you and says, Christian, I'm, I'm ready to start it. What would you tell him? It's a great question. I I would advise to recognize where that attitude is going to serve you and where it's going to really limit your options going forward and damage relationships and damage brand and tarnish your your legacy because those decisions early on really impact what culture grows. And it's much more difficult. I mean, 2019, Travis has left the the organization completely, no longer a board member, those types of things, but we're still talking about it. The, The memory of what we learned about this organization during that time stays. And so it's important to get that right because these things stick around and those early decisions. So be very wary of where do we need that? We need that disruption to challenge convention, to think through how products can, you know, when when other people are saying no, when we can say yes and and really innovate and, and invent new things but not where we're flaunting convention and social norms and expectations to, to just party harder or to serve some appetite that we have at others' expense. So, you know, COVID-19 taught us that perceptions of senior leaders increased because COVID-19 forced leaders to communicate with their, their teams and their workforces in ways they never had. They had to become more human, more accessible. And we know that positive perceptions of senior leaders have improved over, you know, 2020. And I think it goes to the point that people want their leaders to be human, mm-hmm. but they also want them to be grownups. Yes, and that would be my message is if I'm an investor, I, I, I spend an inordinate amount of money on, on documenting and protecting my equity investment. I've got warrants. I've got convertible debt instruments. I've got complex corporate finance. 
and I protect myself all sorts of ways legally, and yet I just leave myself exposed from an HR perspective. And I don't understand why. And I personally think we're going to see, you know, it's it was noted in the journal today, private equity is 50 years old. As an industry, it's it's been around for 50 years, and I think we're going to see a maturation in it. And in one way, understanding that, you know, with Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and everything else, we've got to take the people side of the business pretty serious. Yeah. Uh, you know, w- one thing I, you've pointed out, and I know we've talked about it, the idea that culture kind of tells the employee what to do when there's not a rule, when there's a regulation. And I've long said you can't legislate every single behavior. And so if you build a, a culture that's morally bankrupt, in, in, in the absence of guidance, the employees are going to follow, <laughs> be informed by that, and they're going to make unethical, bad decisions because that's the culture they're, they're operating in, and it's uh, not going to lead to great things. Well, thanks for uh, listening with us. If you have any comments, please reach out to us at info at decisionwise.com. We welcome suggestions as to future topics or leaders that you would like to profile. We really enjoy this podcast, and we're grateful that we get a chance each month to work on it. Again, for more information about DecisionWise and its products and services, please visit us at decisionwise.com. 